what's called mindfulness is really mind training. Uh, but the point is to do it. I would I would suggest that because it helps enormously, as we've said, with getting your own internal world uh, manageable, so that you're not constantly being rocked by turbulence. And that helps you take in information fully, understand it more deeply, and then you can respond agilely. That was Dr. Daniel Goleman on Psychologists Off the Clock. Curious what psychologists chat about over coffee? We are three clinical psychologists who love to discuss the best ideas from psychology. I'm Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. And from coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. In this podcast, we explore the psychological principles that we use in our clinical work. And we bring you ideas from psychology that can help you flourish in your work, parenting, relationships, and health. Thank you for listening to Psychologist Off the Clock. This is Diana here. I want to let you know that I'm going to be conducting a workshop on psychological flexibility and some of the ACT principles that we talk a lot about here on Psychologists Off the Clock. It's going to be in Santa Barbara on Sunday, February 17th from 1 to 3.30 at Yoga Soup. And it's for both professionals, but also for the general public. It would be a great thing to bring your partner to on Valentine's weekend and just a great way to also take care of yourself on Valentine's weekend. So I hope to see you there. You can sign up at yogasoup.com under events, and you can also sign up uh, by clicking through the links that connect you to Yoga Soup on our website. It's going to be an experiential workshop and a great way for you to learn some of the skills that we talk about on this podcast. I hope to see some of you there. When you think about the qualities of a good leader or a good coach or a good friend, maybe a good partner, you may notice that there's a common commonality among those qualities and it's not IQ. And more likely than not, you would want someone who's aware of their own emotions and responsive to the emotions of others, someone who is emotionally intelligent. And today we have the honor of talking with Dr. Daniel Goleman, who is best known for spreading this concept of emotional intelligence to our businesses and our schools and just to our common language with one another. And we're also going to talk with Dr. Goleman about his work investigating the research on meditation uh, with, with his recent book, Altered Traits, with his co-author and neuro- neuroscientist, Richie Davidson. I love this episode. It, it blew me away on so many levels, but I think this concept of emotional intelligence is just so very obviously important. And he talks about it as, um, you know, more important than your IQ. Your EQ is more important than your IQ once you are in a given position. And I think that that really speaks to sort of the types of skills that are encompassed by emotional intelligence. And one of the things that I think about as a working parent is the kinds of skills that get enhanced by being in so many different domains. And as hard as it is, the ways that they allow you to grow and stretch. And I think that emotional intelligence for working parents grows as a result of our being uh, pushed in all different directions. And I think it's sort of one of those surprising gifts that come with being um, with having to juggle so many things. And so it's kind of an interesting thing to think about in the context of this emotional intelligence conversation. So that, that kind of struck me. Debbie, how about you? Oh, I loved it too. I mean, I've been a big fan of his emotional intelligence, the original book for years. So it was really fun to listen to. And I just love that concept. I think what was new for me in this episode, well, there were a lot of new things, but I think the, the part that I was intrigued by was his work on leadership. I think I've just taken a personal interest in leadership and have been doing some reading on that and just trying to think about my own leadership skills in certain areas. And he really talks about, you know, I guess the importance of being sort of open to feedback and, you know, having some empathy toward others as a leader. And I think that's so important. I'm actually so intrigued. I think I'm going to take a look at some of his work on leadership now because I wasn't really familiar with that. So it was really cool. Great, great interview, Diana. Great. And as a gift to all of you during the holidays, we thought it would be nice for some of you to try out one of the practices that Dr. Goldman mentioned in this interview. 
So I recorded a loving kindness meditation, and this is the type of meditation that, as he talks about, has been linked to both um, good health outcomes as well as increasing compassion and self-compassion. And if you go to the show notes, you'll be able to see the link to this loving kindness meditation. So we hope that you can practice it during the holidays. It may just help you out with some of those difficult family interactions that show up for you. That's wonderful. And if you could also help us out when you go order one of Dr. Goldman's books, use our Amazon link on our website. That helps support the podcast. And just a little tip, Dr. Goldman's book called A Force for Good, The Dalai Lama's Vision for Our World would be a really wonderful and inspiring holiday gift for your friends and family. Daniel Goldman, best known for his worldwide bestseller, Emotional Intelligence, is most recently co-author of Altered Traits, Science Reveals How Meditation Changes Your Mind, Brain, and Body. A frequent speaker to businesses of all kinds and sizes, Goldman has worked with leaders around the globe, examining the way social and emotional competencies impact the bottom line. Goldman's articles in the Harvard Business Review are among the most frequently requested reprints of all time. His article, The Focus Leader, won the 2013 Harvard Business Review McKinsey Award for Best Article of the Year. Goldman has been ranked among the 25 most influential business leaders by several business publications, including Time and the Wall Street Journal. Apart from his writing on emotional intelligence, Goldman has written books on topics including self-deception, creativity, transparency, meditation, social and emotional learning, eco-literacy, and the ecological crisis. Welcome, Dr. Goldman. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's really wonderful to have you here. And actually, I pulled out my textbook of emotional intelligence to see which edition I had, because I know you're on edition 10 now. And it was from 1995. So it was, <laughs> you've been on my bookshelf for a long time. And it's a real honor <laughs> to, yeah, to have you here in uh -huh. person. So I know that some a lot of things have changed since the first edition of Emotional Intelligence, but a lot of things have remained the same. And I'd love to maybe start with, you know, you, you've been a pioneer in really shifting the field of psychology from a model of pathology towards one of psychological wellness. And maybe we could start by talking about what it means to be emotionally intelligent and its value among other types of intelligences like IQ that a lot of people know about. Sure. Uh, first of all, emotional intelligence, the way I define it, and there's several models running around, uh, it has four parts, self-awareness, self-management, uh, social awareness, mainly empathy, and then relationship skills. And um, the difference between having those abilities and not having them uh, is immense, because if you don't have them, you're not likely to have successful relationships or to be an effective leader or to be someone people want to have on their team even uh, or a good teacher or a good anything because uh, you asked about the relationship between IQ and emotional intelligence. This is really interesting. IQ is, a, you know, the, the famously the best predictor of what kind of job you can get and hold. This is why it correlates with lifetime salary, with, uh, you know, success in your career and so on to a point. And the point is telling. The point is once you get into the game, uh, you can get an MBA, you can get a, a master's in counseling, you can get a PhD in psychology, uh, you can be a top executive uh, with a high IQ, and you need an IQ of about one standard deviation above the norm, 114, 115 or so, to handle the cognitive complexity of any of those callings. The problem is once you get into the field, you're competing with people who are as smart as you are. So there's what's called a floor effect for IQ, uh, which narrows the, the range. In fact, there was a, a paper, an article in a, a good peer review journal published in the last year that suggested that after 120 IQ, there's no correlation with leadership success or performance. And th this has been very intriguing to me because I've you know, gone to school with very high IQ people and seen some people do well or well enough. Some people do poorly. And um, the explanation became clear to me when I started looking at what are called competence models, the, the modeling um, competence uh, movement started actually as one of my main mentors 
when I was in graduate school myself, David McClellan, who suggested back then in the American psychologist that if you want to be, if you want to hire the person who'd be best for a job, don't look at their IQ, don't look at personality profiles, don't look at letters of recommendation, certainly, but instead look at people in your own organization that hold that position now or have held it in the past, who are in the top 10% by whatever metric makes sense for that position and compare them with people who are average, do a systematic analysis and see what competencies or abilities distinguish the stars that you don't see in the average and then hire people that look like the stars. That's called competence modeling now and most world-class organizations have it. When I, after I wrote Emotional Intelligence, I looked at more than 100 competence models from a range of organizations. And it was really interesting. I just want to know how many of the distinguishing competencies, the ones that, not the threshold, threshold is what you need to get the job. Distinguishing is what you need, need to be outstanding. And how many of the distinguishing competencies are in the IQ domain and how many are in the emotional intelligence domain. And, uh, you know, for jobs at all kinds, uh, the emotional intelligence based abilities were twice as common in competence models as purely cognitive ones. And the higher you go in the organization, the more it mattered. So for top leadership, for example, 80 or 90% of the competencies that organizations themselves have found distinguish their stars are based on emotional intelligence. So they both matter, but they matter differently. IQ is extremely important in what you can handle and what kind of job you can get, but it doesn't guarantee that you'll uh, emerge as a star. Mm -hmm. And it seems that that concept of emotional intelligence and the importance of teaching emotional intelligence to our children is becoming more and more um, relevant in the modern day environment. So someone like um, the historian Yuval Noah Harari has argued that our schools are focusing too much on teaching skills like how to solve a quadratic equation. And what we really need to be teaching our kids is how to deal with change and how to preserve our mental balance and how to, when we face challenges, how to really have emotional intelligence. How do, how do, these, how do you teach these competencies and, and what, what does it look like when you're cultivating sure. emotional intelligence? Sure. Well, well uh, you know, there are two levels that we, you can teach. It. One is adult education. Uh, a lot of psychologists are going into coaching now. Uh, and what they're coaching, uh, particularly executives for, is emotional intelligence, pretty much, because there are, uh, you know, studies that show that people are hired for the business expertise, but fired for failure in emotional intelligence. Basically, the boss that, that you love to work for is someone who's highly emotional intelligent. The boss you dread working for is low in it. But let's talk about kids, because I think that's really important. When I was writing emotional intelligence, I uh, worked together with a group that founded something called the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, CASEL, C-A-S-E-L. And it's really spurred a worldwide movement in integrating what are called social-emotional learning skills or emotional intelligence by another name uh, into the curriculum from kindergarten to, you know, K, K to 12 uh, through the whole school. And it's done in a developmentally appropriate way. It teaches that whole spectrum self-awareness, managing your emotions, particularly turbulent emotions. Uh, that, you know, that speaks to Harari's handling change. You need emotional balance. And also empathy, which is really important if uh, people will grow up to be good citizens, good spouses, good workers. They have to care about other people and tune into other people. And then that's, those are the basis of relationship skills. And they're very elaborate curricula now that integrate social emotional skills into the academic, uh, you know, year and do it in, in many different ways. There are actually one to 200. I couldn't yeah. encapsulate them all, but it's a different kind of learning, but it's the kind of education. I think that children need to be whole. If we only focus on quadratic equations, well, let me ask you, when was the last time you needed to solve right. a quadratic equation? Uh, but when was the last time you needed to tune in and, and connect with someone? Well, yeah. maybe today or tomorrow or yesterday. 
And that's exactly when we were choosing the school for our kids, we chose a school because it integrated social emotional learning into it. And it's so fun to see how teachers actually do that. So for example, in my child's kindergarten class classroom, when she's pairing them up to send them to a science lesson, she says, okay, hold on, before I pair you up, let's talk about this. If I pair Mary with John and Mary says, oh, yeah, I don't want to be with John. How do you think that would make John feel, <laughs> right? And so she's building oh, in empathy yeah, and perspective yeah. taking right there in the science sure. lesson. Or at the end of the day, they uh -huh. do um, appreciations and concerns where the children get a chance to problem solve and talk about the conflicts that arose from the day and be able to hear, listen to each other, reflect back what they're hearing and come up with a solution together. And all of that is, those are the skill sets that we need in our leadership of our country or that we need just as adults to navigate the challenges of being human and interacting with other humans. So, and I know it's directly related to your work. So I really appreciate that. It's impacting my life directly in, in the, oh, that, my children's lives. Oh, yeah. I, I, it's wonderful to hear. I'm, I'm glad you found the school. And, uh, it, you know, it's not everywhere, but it's in no. a surprising number of schools now. It, but it's called different things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I uh, went to schools in New Haven, Connecticut. It's called social development there. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, uh, and they teach it, for example, um, on every wall of every classroom, there's a poster of a stoplight, red light, yellow light, green light. It says, if you're getting upset, remember the stoplight. Yeah. Red light, stop, calm down, think before you act. Well, that's really important learning for handling emotions because you can get angry in a second, but you don't want to act out of the anger. And that's what it's teaching kids. You want to learn to calm yourself down a bit, think about what you might do. The yellow light says think of a range of things you could do and what the consequence would be. And green light, pick the best one and try it out. And that becomes, uh, that's actually in the culture of the whole school. Uh, and that's the kind of lesson and it doesn't take time out from other things as you point out it's well we're lining up let's use that as a teaching moment one of the things i really appreciate about that you write about in the book is some of the biological underpinnings and, and brain changes that happen when we're getting flooded by an emotional experience and i think it actually by understanding what's happening in our brains it it helps bring a sense of maybe self-compassion to it's not my fault that I'm getting it feels so chaotic when I'm having a strong emotional reaction right. and you you talk sure. a lot about the amygdala and an amygdala hijack that can happen and how some of these early early experiences that we had as children can get actually stored in memories in our amygdala and then can get activated again as an adult can you talk a bit about the architecture of the brain and what happens when we're having strong emotional reactions Yes, and, and remind me, I want to tell you a story from yeah. a, a fifth grade classroom about that. Uh, basically, the brain evolved from the bottom up, and in the midbrain are the social circuitry. The social circuitry, particularly important, is the amygdala, which is the uh, brain's radar for threat. The brain actually, is, uh, the main function of the brain is to help us survive. And its, its design, its architecture was put in place during the hundreds, thousands of years when we were under threat biologically by things that could kill us, mm -hmm. could eat us, or that we had to run after and eat. And the amygdala was the critical radar for avoiding danger and finding food. And uh, today, the amygdala is still the brain's radar for threat. Uh, and unfortunately, I guess, or maybe fortunately, we live in a complex social reality and the dangers the amygdala uh, is using, uh, is reacting to might be things like, um, I'm not being treated fairly instead of this is going to eat me. But we have the same biological reaction. And the way the brain is wired, when the amygdala declares an emotional emergency, it can take over the brain's executive center, the prefrontal cortex behind the forehead. And it, uh, ha it does certain things that make our responses in the modern world off. One is it fixates attention on what it thinks the threat is. So once our attention is fixated uh, on what the amygdala declares a threat, it's very hard to think of other things. And in fact, 
one of the ways this can go wrong is what psychologists call rumination, where you think about why didn't she answer that email or why did she not invite me to that party or whatever it may be. That's that the amygdala can see that as a threat today. And you may be thinking about it a week later, two in the morning, you're waking up thinking about it. And rumination, of course, is worry out of control and out of place, the word that doesn't help. Mm -hmm. The function of worry, which the amygdala triggers, is to help us fo focus on a problem and solve it and know what to do. But if we just loop and loop and loop in rumination, we never solve it. So that's one function of the amygdala. The other uh, is that it tends to fall back on overlearned responses. You mentioned that we may learn in childhood a, a repertoire of emotional habits that we then bring to our uh, adult relationships. Uh, and a lot of therapy has to do with unraveling that. Well, I, that's the amygdala at work because it's uh, taking the response you learned, you know, over and over with your mom or whatever it was, uh, and then using it inappropriately. So we do or say something during an amygdala hijack, if you will, uh, that we regret later because it was inappropriate. It didn't work. It was from, you know, it was from back then, but we used it now. Uh, so the amygdala hijack is, uh, is a part of our biological wiring, which leads us to do things that just don't work. The story I want to tell you, uh, it was told to me by a teacher in the social emotional learning program that she said she heard it from a mother, uh, this five year, it was a snowy day. Uh, and if you're in California, you have to imagine a snowy day, <laughs> yeah. very cold. And um, this five-year-old wanted to go out and play. And his mom said, well, that's fine, but you have to put on your snowsuit. And he had a meltdown. He just, no, I won't do it. And crying and yelling and so on. And that went on for several minutes. And then he suddenly he stopped. He went into his room and came out few minutes later and calmly went on put on his snowsuit and went out mm. was going out and his mom said hey what just happened he said well my guard dog got upset so i went into my room and had my wise owl talk to it what what he's doing is talking about neuroscience for five-year-olds mm -hmm. in his sel he learned that the amygdala is the guard dog mm. it's your radar for threat and, but there's a wise owl, it's actually a prefrontal cortex, yeah. which can talk to it and calm it down. And I would say that, you know, one definition of maturity is expanding the gap between impulse and reaction. And that's a lot of what therapy is for, is to help us do that. First, to be mindful, notice we're having the amygdala attack. And then know what to do so that you can calm down, think it through, and then react in a better way. Mm -hmm. It seems like therapy being one avenue to help develop that prefrontal cortex and how, you know, regulating emotion. And then another component that you've written more recently about is meditation. And in Altered Traits, you, with Richie Davidson, you write about how we can actually work towards changing in a, like in a permanent way some of our, our responses. And when I was reading that book, I, I thought about my dad. He's, he's actually a meditation teacher in, the, in this community. He's been oh, meditating oh. for years. And my parents have okay. been married for years too, for like over 40 years. And my mom will always say, you don't know how much your father has changed. And she says he's changed so much because of his practice, his meditation practice. So and usually you don't hear that from somebody that's been married 40 years. <laughs> you hear the opposite, <laughs> right? Not changed right. in a good, in a good way. Yeah. Uh, but right. but right. I, I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the role that, that um, in some of your research in this area of how meditation can right. help with that amygdala hijack. Sure. Well, my co-author, Richard Davidson, is a neuroscientist at the University of Wisconsin. And what he and I were graduate students together years ago, and we were both interested in meditation, but it was way too early. In fact, we were advised that doing our dissertations on meditation was probably a career-ending move. Mm -hmm. This was a yeah. long time ago. Yeah. Uh, when we came back and looked at the meditation literature decades later, we found that there were more than 6,000 uh, articles in peer-reviewed journals on meditation. And... Uh, we, we applied a very rigorous lens. We looked at the top 
articles, the ones in the A-level journals that are reviewed most critically uh, and therefore are the best, uh, the ones that have the ironclad methodology, uh, and those are the ones we reviewed in the book Altered Traits, which is really about the science of meditation. And what we found was very telling, that the effects that show up right at the beginning, for example, are focusing attention, better concentration skills, which is, for us, that's kind of obvious because at base, every kind of meditation or mindfulness is training attention. Mm -hmm. The basic move in every kind of meditation is you focus on one thing, your mind wanders, or why it that way, you notice it wandered, and you bring it back. That's strengthening the neural circuitry for paying attention. Yeah. So in a way, it was no surprise, but it shows up very early. The other is calming the amygdala. That's another uh, early effect. So that, for example, there's now a, a popularity of mindfulness everywhere, yeah. and that's a, a basic meditation. And the research shows that, yes, indeed, it does uh, in, enhance your attention and it does calm you. We also found a dose-response relationship. The longer you've meditated or been a meditator and practice, say, daily or go on retreats a year or a couple of years or whatever, uh, the stronger the benefits become. Uh, so you, know, you, you get someone like your father, and I really appreciate testimony from your mom because she's the one who would be most right. attuned <laughs> to how he is. So, uh, And we find that long-term meditators like him have even a greater um, change. For example, one of them is in, in what's called resilience. The operational definition of resilience is how long it takes you to go from the peak of an emotional upheaval, a medulla hijack, uh, to calm again, to baseline. Mm-hmm. And it, that uh, shows up, that, in, that recovery gets quicker and quicker. So it shows up at the beginning. But the longer you've been a meditator, the even quicker it gets. Uh, and that's a way of widening that gap between impulse and reaction. And uh, I think that may be part of what she's seeing in, in your dad. Mm-hmm. Uh, at any rate, uh, th- th- we find that the scientific literature makes the case that uh, meditation not only increases your attention, or enhances it and helps you stay more calm, so you're triggered less often, when you are triggered, it isn't as upsetting, and you recover more quickly. But there's some surprises, too. It seems to slow the aging of the brain. Uh, it seems to, for a long-term meditator, if you do a day of meditation, the genes that create inflammation throughout the body go quiet. Mm-hmm. It has an inhibitory effect on inflammatory genes. But no one expected that. Yeah. So more and more benefits are showing up. It's being used clinically now for depression, for anxiety, uh, for pain, chronic pain that can't be relieved by uh, medicine. Uh, And also, there's a lot of research going on now for ADHD, which is kind of a no-brainer. If you think about attention deficit, why don't we train attention? Right. So that's in the pipeline, too. Right. And what's interesting is that what you write about of it helps you come back to, you know, come back to a place of calm when you've been emotionally hijacked, but it doesn't make you um, completely closed off to emotion. In fact, meditation and long-term meditators, particularly ones that are practicing loving kindness meditation, have more compassion. And it's this balance of not getting overwhelmed by their feelings, but also being able to be present with the pain in others. And that's a really, I think, important concept because especially as a therapist that's the skill set i want to develop is how do i not get overwhelmed by my client's emotion but also not cut off from their emotion i want to be there to be compassionate and present with them yes uh, thank you for bringing that up uh one of the uh, things i'd like to clarify is that managing emotion doesn't mean doing away with emotion just being able to handle the distressing emotions and the disturbing emotions so they don't distress you and disturb you so much uh, and that's one thing that meditation helps you with. But it also, you mentioned the loving kindness meditation. I was talking before about the effects of a mindfulness meditation, where, for example, you focus on the breath and you bring your attention back to it mm-hmm. when it wanders. You mentioned loving kindness or uh, well wishing. You know, you think of someone you're grateful toward and you wish that they'd be safe and happy and healthy and 
have a fulfilled life and so on. And you make the same wishes for yourself and people you love, people you know, people you work with, people in your community, everyone everywhere finally. And it turns out that if you do that regularly, it strengthens the circuitry that we actually we share with all mammals. It's the parental caretaking circuits. Uh, it's a, a parent's love for a child, but what you're doing is broadening that outward to everyone. And what that does, the research finds, is make people more altruistic, more likely to help someone in need, um, happier, interestingly, and uh, more generous. And also, this is very important for therapists or people in, uh, you know, in the medical profession, nurses and so on. When you're with someone who is frustrated and angry and upset, uh, the brain is designed for those emotions to be uh, communicated to you. And you may feel the same thing. And if you feel that chronically and you don't know what to do with them, you can reach a state where you're chronically hijacked and you're emotionally exhausted. And that's when people quit. They're, you know, nursing, it's a big problem. So the alternative, what, what emotional intelligence and meditation bring to this is the ability to manage your own emotional reaction to the other person's upset so you can be present to them and not pull away. Most people pull back and turn them turn off mm -hmm. uh, when when they're confronted with someone who's in that state. But if you're really compassionate, you stay present with the person. You can, for example, hospice workers, people yeah. who are dying, uh, need this very much. The ability to simply be present, even if the other person is in pain, is you know angry, whatever it may be but to be there for that person. And of course, every therapist needs that. Yeah, every therapist, every partner, every parent needs it. And uh, it's everyone. Yeah. Everyone, every human. Yeah. And I, so that's also kind of an interesting concept that some of the early research on meditation, everything was kind of glopped together. Just meditation was considered meditation. But what you really tease apart is that there's different types of meditation. And just like if you were doing exercise and you were lifting weights, it would have a different impact on your body than going for a run. They're both exercise, but they have different benefits and, and outcomes. The same exactly. is true for our meditation practices, whether it's loving kindness or mindfulness or breath um, work. And you're kind of teasing apart the differences there. Yeah, and actually, you know, there is many different kinds of meditation as there are different sports. Yeah. Uh, once you really get into it, and it, it, it's uh, it's exactly what you said. Whatever system you're training is the one that improves, and different meditations focus on different systems. There's a, a whole set of meditations that involve visualization, for example. Yeah. Well, that's different from well-wishing. It's different from concentration. Each of them has its own set of benefits. So you've been a meditator for a long time. It sounds like I loved reading about some of your early travels and meetings in, um, as you were a graduate student. What kind of changes, trait changes have you noticed in yourself from meditating this long? Oh, you know, we're not really very good observers of ourselves. <laughs> yeah. You have to ask my wife. Your what would your wife say? <laughs> <laughs> or your children? Yeah. I, that's a good question. I really don't know. She's known me a long time. <laughs> when I was in graduate school, I was very uh, fortunate to get a traveling fellowship to India. And that allowed me to meet with some very um, highly seasoned yogis. Tibetan lamas, people who had been long, long, long-term serious practitioners. In those cultures, interestingly, um, there's an understanding that it's, it's worth supporting people who are dedicating their lives to meditation because they become very nourishing. Yeah. Uh, even their presence is uh, not only pleasant, but you, you actually catch something of where they are. And I met um, some yogis and lamas who were quite extraordinary in terms of their sheer presence, loving quality, uh, equanimity, uh, many, many qualities that I'd never encountered at that level before. And I thought about my teachers back at Harvard uh, who were great, you know, scholars or whatever, but they weren't at all like these yeah. people. And I thought that was one thing actually spurred me to want to do research on meditation because I thought, hmm, something's going on here that we don't know about in our psychology. And at that time, as you point out, um, I was in clinical psych and uh, it was all about what's wrong with this person, not what's right or what could be right. 
we've added that more recently, and I'm really relieved. Right. When I was doing my first year of graduate school, it was going through diagnosis by diagnosis, so OCD or generalized anxiety exactly. disorder, and right. then what is the treatment for that diagnosis? And then I was so stressed and sleep deprived, and I had been a long, I had been doing <laughs> yoga for a while. I started, you know, oh. noticing I'm checking the same boxes <laughs> for myself, right? Until you know, I actually ended up taking time off from graduate school and going to an ashram and and learning and deepening my practice of yoga, oh. so that I could go back uh -huh. and actually do this work. And um, went on to research more about mind, doing research in DBT, which has a big mindfulness component. So it it definitely is a newer shift in the field, but also this understanding that to be mentally and and psychologically well, we we really need. These, these types of practices, whether it's developing emotional intelligence or some of these, you know, meditation practices can be really, really helpful. And I'm yeah. so glad to see the field shifting as it has. Well, I think the world uh, actually needs them more now than ever because the pace of change, technological change, the, uh, you know, the seductive distractions of our tech. Yeah. Uh, we, and also the fact that the fact that everyone carries a cell phone Right. has melted the wall between work and the rest of your life. Right. And that makes life more pressured than ever. And I think that creates greater and greater value for any method that can help you recover. Because the body is designed, the, center, the uh, sympathetic nervous system you know, gets you excited, gets you stressed, gets you uh, distressed. But the parasympathetic nervous system is supposed to take over and help you recover and help you relax and calm. And we just don't have time for that in our lives. So now we have to make time. I'm going to do my yoga now. I'm going to mm -hmm. do my meditation. I'm going to take the dog for a walk, whatever it may be. But we have to make an effort to do something that uh, in the design of the body was supposed to be completely natural. You bring up this cell phone and, you know, one thing that I've been noticing or have been concerned about is if 90% of our communication is nonverbal, but now we've shifted our communication to just verbal texting, even, even you know, just texting, what is going to get, how is that going to impact our empathy and emotional intelligence as a society? What Are you concerned well, about Well, yeah, I am. Texting is an empathy killer. Yeah. Uh, the the brain, the social circuitry of the brain is designed for face-to-face -face interaction. And the further you get from that, uh, the more problems are created as, as a byproduct of however you're communicating. So, uh, you know, video conference is, is not that bad compared to face-to-face. -to -face. Uh, telephone, the voice carries a lot of emotional information. You don't pick up non-verbal cues that you would see. Uh, but then when you get to text only, uh, you know, an email, there's actually negativity bias mm -hmm. research finds. If a sender says that message was positive, the receiver is likely to say it was neutral. If the sender says neutral, the receiver is likely to say negative. Wow. And uh, this creates a setup for what's called cyber disinhibition or flaming where uh, people will have an amygdala hijack and furiously type a message and yes. hit send before thinking about it. And uh, that creates an upset in the other person. Uh, and face-to-face, uh, -face, you would never say those things to the other person because your, your brain is taking in uh, you know infinite amount of information moment to moment and telling you, don't say this, say that do it this way, do it that way. In other words, have an effective exchange, but it doesn't have that feedback loop online. Mm -hmm. So that's the disinhibition. So the amygdala does whatever it wants. Right. And then and it can, can go into that like, ruminating and storytelling after we receive that negative. You know, we can go on and on exactly. about that. Or that neutral yeah. message that we think was negative. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What I've been seeing more of is people now sending voice texts as sort of like a way of sort of, I think people are starting to figure this out, that this isn't working yeah, so well in my partnership, right. or we keep on getting in fights when we just text each other, so I'm going to use my voice instead, and I do appreciate that. It's a, At least you hear the intonation of the voice. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. And the intonation can completely change the nuance of any word. 
mm-hmm. or any phrase. Absolutely. Very important. So it's a step in the right direction. I think, frankly, I think these are transitional technologies. Eventually, we'll have holograms yeah. where you'll see the whole person. Uh, and maybe it will be the next best thing to actually being with that person. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I heard a talk recently by someone who was on the team that developed the first iPhone. He said, we're all single 20-somethings working, you know, 24-7. We try to make it as seductive as we could. And he said, now I have two kids and I really regret it. Yeah, yeah. Think about it, you know. Today's kids have never known a time you couldn't lose yourself in a device with a screen. And I, my fear is that the skills of emotional intelligence have been passed on in life. And the more screen time, the more sheer hours of screen time children have, the fewer hours they have where they absorb the lessons of emotional intelligence, which for me is another argument of getting it into schools. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You have addressed uh, emotional intelligence with schools. How are you working with uh, businesses in terms of cultivating uh, emotional intelligences for for CEOs and and business leaders in that way? Well, you know, the, there are basically five steps that that you need to follow in coaching someone, and the first step uh, may mean that that CEO won't be coached because you have to ask them, do you really care? And Mm -hmm. there's a paradox that the higher you go in an organization, the less candid feedback you get about how you are doing as a leader. Uh, And at the top, do too many people are afraid of you to tell you the truth? If you have, you know, you're a bully, who's going to tell you that? Uh, No one who works for you. And this is one reason uh, that some of the business literature is saying that every top executive needs a committee, a group of people they they respect, trust, who are not working for them, who can be honest with them. Uh, because otherwise you can fall into a self-deception now where you have a huge blind spot. And many CEOs uh, who are in the bully category have that blind spot. And for that reason, I say are uncoachable because they won't even acknowledge the problem. What What we do... In, uh, I, I have a, a new coaching program where we're credentialing coaches and emotional intelligence um, coaching for, for business people and anyone else. Uh, and the, the key step is to get an overall assessment. It's like getting a physical, you know, get a reading, not just of your four domains, self-awareness, self-management, empathy, and so on, but rather the competencies that are based on each of those that have been found over and over to make someone an outstanding leader. Are you a, are you uh, good at coaching people who work for you? Are good at influencing? Or how do you uh, manage your own disruptive emotions? Are you agile? Can you adapt? Do you have a growth mindset, positive outlook? All of these things. Uh, you know, we have twelve competencies that we assess for, and you can be strong in some and not in others. Then, after you get that assessment, by the way, you get assessed by people again, whose opinions you respect, who rate you anonymously. Mm -hmm. That means they can be honest. And you get the feedback aggregated. You don't know who said what. That lets these people free to be open with you. Uh, And after you get that, then you can work with the coach on, well, where would I benefit the most from trying to change a habit or uh, get better at a skill? And then you need to have some support to, to keep doing that. We find that if you practice, which is the final step, practice at every naturally occurring opportunity, uh, a change for the better will happen within three to six months. And it's instantiated in the brain. That is your strengthening circuitry for, say, being a better listener instead of just cutting people off. Uh, That's one that's very common. And once you do that, we find we've done follow-up research up to seven years later, people where you work now will say, yes, you still like that. That's because it's a brain change. It's not just, I don't know if you know the world of human resources. There's something called spray and pray Mm. where you send people to a two week offsite, you know, workshop on something and then you pray something will stick, but it typically doesn't. That's a very different mode of learning. Right. So there's actually neuroplasticity of the brain. You can change how people change their brains and also change, change how people are operating in their lives and have it have it be a long-term effect. Yes, just I, as, I think, yeah. 
Yeah, I think therapists do this and coaches do it too. Mm -hmm. You you work systematically with someone to help them first understand what it is they're doing and second, what they can do better or differently that would have a better path in their lives or in their work. And then you help them sustain that effort uh, so that it, the change will last. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In your some of your studies, you've also talked a lot about purpose and the importance of purpose and meaning uh, in terms of having um, a, a, a life that is happy and worthwhile. Can you talk a little bit about, in particular, your work with the Dalai Lama around this topic and what you've explored in terms of meaning and purpose? Well, I, I wrote a book uh, for his 80th birthday w with him uh, about his vision. And, and this is not a Buddhist book. It's a book for everybody. It's a vision, global vision. And he basically urges people to do three things. Mm -hmm. One is to compose yourself, you know, do your yoga or whatever that's going to help you manage your own internal states so you can be more calm and clear. And then the second is where purpose comes in, to adopt a moral compass that's more than just about yourself and furthering yourself and aggrandizing your own ego, but rather what you can do to help make things better in, in any way. And here I, I appreciate the work of an old friend of mine, Howard Gardner, who's a psychologist at Harvard, who's been talking about good work. Good work aligns three things. What your skill set is, you know, what you're excellent at, uh, what engages you, what you love doing, and what your ethics uh, hmm. suggest. And it, that's the purpose, the, the moral compass. And if you align those things, then you have work that you love, or you'll be doing, uh, you know, you'll have a mission that really engages you and feeds you. Uh, and the, the third thing the Dalai Lama says is, whatever it is, do it. Act now. Hmm. Uh, don't wait. Don't, you know, just do it. Even if you won't live to see the fruits of, of what your endeavor involves, start. Uh, and, and he encourages everyone to do that because he sees the power of an aggregate of people doing uh, many different things to uh, enhance the world, to help other people and so on. And that's the force for good. Mm -hmm. What would be three things you would recommend? Yeah, so I uh, I think meditation actually is very helpful across the board. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the belief system that goes with meditations. Uh, I mean, if you're a, uh, a Catholic and, and that really sings to you, there are meditations, the presencing method, uh, for example, it, within that faith tradition, or if you have no particular religious belief, just do the practice. For example, uh, what's called mindfulness is really mind training. Mm -hmm. uh, but the point is to do it. I would, I would suggest that because it helps enormously, as we've said, with getting your own internal world uh, manageable so that you're not constantly being rocked by turbulence. And that helps you take in information fully, understand it more deeply, and then you can respond agilely. So the second thing, I think, is to ad adopt that moral compass. What is your purpose? What has meaning for you? What for, what really sings to you? And then uh, putting that together to use the, I'd say, the emotional intelligence skill set, which is for highly effective leadership, highly effective people to execute on whatever that purpose is, whatever is going to feed you as you help other people. Yes. So meditation, finding your own sense of purpose, and then using emotional intelligence to, skills to execute that in your life. Yeah, that sounds exactly. wonderful. Exactly, yes, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Goldman. We, we're going to post some of the links to the coaching program that you mentioned, as well oh, as good. other online programs if you're interested. You also have a program on developing emotional intelligence uh, for individuals that want to develop it themselves. Uh, we'll link to that, exactly. as well as a lot of your books. So Altered Traits being your most recent book, but also Emotional Intelligence and some of your other books. Those will all be on our website so people can, um, as well as link to this podcast so people can click on those. Uh -huh. Great. There's um, a couple of books you may not know about. Yeah. They're available only online from Keystep Media, 
Uh, one is um, the brain and emotional intelligence. Mm. Another is what makes a leader. That's all my articles from Harvard Business Review. Oh, great. Uh, and uh, a few more. There's. A, I just released a primer on the twelve each of the twelve competencies. Uh, for example, empathy or uh, adaptability, uh, and those are all available from Key Steps. So you can get the URLs. Great. And so we'll, please share them with your listeners. Yes, yeah. absolutely. We will. It's been an honor and a delight to have you on. And thank you so much for taking the time in your day to visit with us. I'm sure the audience has a lot of takeaways from this um, meeting. So thank you so much. Diana, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Psychologist Off the Clock. You can find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you are having a mental health emergency, please dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources on our webpage. Our website is www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's www.offtheclockpsych.com. Www.offtheclockpsych.com.